obvious first question. 28 years in the making. What's the vibe in Montreal heading into game three tomorrow night? Uh, there's a lot of excitement here for sure. I mean, it's been, as you mentioned, 28 years. Uh, the team hasn't been all that competitive in that time. So I think there's a lot of people really excited. There's a bit of disappointment that public health authorities in Quebec didn't let more than 3,500 people in the building. So that's kind of mitigated the excitement. I think some people are upset about that. Other people are, are relieved because, you know, we're not quite out of this pandemic thing just yet. But um, I think there are a lot of people who would have liked to have had at least a half full crowd in there. So that has mitigated some of the excitement. But I would think there's going to be some nice camera shots of the crowd outside the Bell Center at, during game three, because if, if the third round and even the second round are any indication, and there you go. I mean, you can only imagine how that's going to be ramped up for, uh, for a Stanley Cup final game, the first one in this city in, uh, in 28 years. I love hockey, and I feel like I could get along great with Habs fans because it is so clear how much they love the game. The question remains... As the series shifts to Montreal, how important will home ice advantage be for the Canadiens at Bell Centre? Well, I mean, the one real aspect of home ice advantage that impacts a game um, is controlling matchups. And so I think we saw in game one uh, that John Cooper was very pleased to have the uh, the Annie Gord line out against the Philip Dano line, which kept the Dano line against uh, or, or away from the Braden point line. Um, and, you know, while the Canadians did made some efforts to try and get away from that in game two, they didn't overly try and disrupt their game plan at all to get away from it. And John Cooper did chase that same matchup again in game two. It didn't work quite as well. I thought the Canadians, you know, obviously carried the play for most of that game. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens in game three. A, Dominic Ducharme is coming back behind the bench after a two week quarantine after testing positive for COVID. Um, and what matchups he's going to chase, but I would imagine he's going to sick that Deno line on the point line, and and a lot of things are going to kind of fall from there. So I feel like the look of the game could be quite different than what we saw in games one and two in Tampa with uh, with a clear defensive assignment for that Deno line and see if the other lines can be freed up to create some more offense. You brought up Ducharme. Any potential lineup changes for game three with him calling the shots now behind that bench? Uh, no, I don't think so. And let's be clear. I mean, you know, he's behind the bench, but he's been calling the shots the way he would normally would from his home. Um, he's been in regular contact with Luke Richardson, Alex Burroughs, and Sean Burke throughout this two-week time that he's been away. Uh, all the decisions that have been made lineup-wise, um, even going right down to the starting lineup for, for a given game, he's involved in. He's been involved between periods with quick phone calls or even text messages with Luke to, to send some messages. So it's not like he's been completely detached from the decision-making process, but I would be surprised if the lineup that you're showing right now is not the lineup that we see in game three. I mean, there's a slight possibility that we could see a Jake Evans come in somewhere up front, but I don't really know where that would be because I feel like the Canadians feel that from top to bottom, they played a really solid game in game two. And so making changes would, would be sort of a mixed message to their group because I think they sold that to their team and said, listen, if we do that in game three, we have a pretty good chance of winning. So to go out and make a change after playing such a solid game in game two would be a bit of a conflicting message. Makes sense. Arpon, thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy game three. Let's spin this thing yep. forward because if you're the Montreal Canadiens, don't you feel a measure of confidence? Certainly Shea Weber talking about we deserved better. Clearly, this was a remarkably different feel. It was the same score through two periods. It was 2-1. But on this night, and I was watching alongside you, Dano, weeks he was doing the broadcast, it felt like a really competitive game. If you're Montreal, game three, what's your mindset? Game three is, listen, we all played them here in game two. We didn't get the result we wanted. We all played them. We're now going back home to the Bell Center. We're going to be playing in front of our fans, albeit limited capacity. Nether issue. Nether they count. will hear the 100,000. They will hear everybody outside, outside the building as well. <laughs> totally. They'll hear the whole province yeah. uh, for sure. But one thing that they will also have, last change. Mm -hmm. Because one factor that's been prevalent in games one and two, as you just said, it showed its face again, the dominant third line led by Coleman and Goudreau, that third line for Tampa. So now I'm curious to see how Montreal de will deploy their assets here in terms of the management minutes played matchups and everything else especially is their head coach 
Dom Ducharme back behind the bench. We hope so. Evidently, he was slated to be back in Game 3. I think Lou Richardson's done an amazing job, but there could be some changes coming in Game in game 3 back at the Bell Center. That's what they have to take going forward. And the positives from this game, as difficult as that can be right after the game, and you're going to be on your pillow and tossing and turning, not sleeping as well tonight because you're going... We, ha- we uh, missed an opportunity here to go back home tied at one the way we played in general. But great teams, and yes, the Tampa Bay Lightning are a great team. And if you're going to slay the Dragon, totally. you almost have to play a perfect game. And you mentioned the word, and I liked it, Weeksy, off air. Situational play, recognition, puck possession, what exactly what went on with that reverse, what exactly went on when Montreal had the puck late in the second period where they just can't let those things happen. And maybe they do win this game because Tampa Bay will make you pay, and they did. The game is going so fast, but the one thing I've learned in my six years around these guys, their minds are going super fast to be able to make all the decisions they have to make in the time they have to make them. All right, Tony, thank you very much. All right, so two goals for Montreal in the first two games of the Stanley Cup final. Clearly, you got to find a way to beat Andre Vasilevsky. They had a four-on-three in this game. No Cole Caulfield on that four-on-three. If you're Montreal, don't you need him out there to score some goals? I think at this point, like you mentioned, you've got two goals in two games. And when you look at your roster, you have one bona fide sniper goal scorer. I don't care if he has one game in this league or 1,000. He's your best natural goal scorer I, i'd love to have seen him on that four and three because it, 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 or you know he is on the power play we see him in those spots but you're getting to the point now where you need to have a, somebody pick a spot on andre vasilevsky i mean we also saw a fluky one go in on him yeah. too so you just need to get shots um on him you need to get volume on him but when you get an opportunity and you get point blank look i, I want that I want that to be on Cole Caulfield's stick, and that's what you should be able to. There's too much working around the perimeter on that four and three, and um, they came away with nothing, and and, uh, it really hurt them in this game. Montreal with plenty of shots in this game, but do you think they're still being a little too selective at times with with those shot opportunities? Yeah, I think so, And, and again, to go back to that Suzuki goal, I mean, Andre Vasilevsky is so difficult to to beat as well as Carey Price, but look what beat both of them in this game at different times. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, just get shots on that, get traffic, and, 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 and find, get, get bodies, limbs, sticks in front, and get some bounces going your way. I, I feel like they're waiting for that perfect shot. You will get your looks eventually. Tampa does that, and they've done that over the last number of years. They will give you looks, and when you get those looks, you have to make them pay. They had three odd man rushes in the first period. They weren't able to get anything from it, but that can't be everything. You just got to get volume on, and they did get volume on. They ended up just shooting themselves in the foot and didn't manage the puck once again. All right, so Montreal going back home, trailing two games to none. Obviously, you want to try to get a split on the road. They didn't do that. Maybe they get a boost in the fact that their head coach could be coming back to the bench in game three. Is that the boost or the shakeup or just just the wake-up call that this team needs at this point? I think maybe to get to the home confines is going to help. Uh, They've got to be desperate. Listen, they played a very good game in a lot of areas, but the problems and the and the mistakes they made, you simply can't. They were catastrophic, and uh, so it, it, they they got to look at the good things they did. Keep sticking with that. They got some volume uh, as far as shots on that. I think you're going to have some matchups here that you're going to like. It's in your favor. Your home ice. You get to control some of that. They need to play with a lead. And if they come out in the Bell Center and get that lead, we're going to see a different Montreal team. Tonight was the perfect opportunity for that, right? They get a couple of power play chances. They have 13 shots in that first period. They're peppering Andre Vasilevsky, yet it's scoreless after one. It's like, what do you do against this team? Yeah, it's so frustrating because, uh, you know, I I said it before, uh, and I'll say it again, I really firmly believe you're not – Tampa wasn't good. They were not crisp on their plays. Their reads weren't great. Uh, they gave up odd man rushes because of bad reads. They weren't crisp in their passing. But they find ways to win because they, they're champions and they, and they know how to do it, right? But when you have a game like that and you don't win or you don't score uh, more than one goal, like it's it's demoralizing, yeah. right? But this is this is the, the problem here for Montreal. What, what are you going to do now is... An, I don't want to say an encore you didn't win, but to to show to take another step in the right direction because you're not going to get a poor performance uh, from Tampa Bay like they got in Game 2. So you're going to have to be even better for the Montreal Canadiens. All right, the Habs heading back home for Game 3, trying to solve the puzzle that is the defending Stanley Cup champion, the Tampa Bay Lightning, on Friday night. Tony? 
Well said, J. Mo. And I turn to you guys, Weeksy and Dano, and I think about what John Cooper said. He expected that Montreal would play better. They did. And he hoped that his team would not regress. Listening to Rupper and J. Mo, it seems like that's the consensus. What's your biggest takeaway from game two? It was a stolen win for Tampa, courtesy of their goalie, Andre Vasilevsky. And we said prior to the NHL international broadcast with EJ and I, I said, Carey Price needs to steal this game for Montreal to really be on firm ground in the series. Andre Vasilevsky had other ideas. He was absolutely sensational in this game. 42 saves on 43 shots. The big cat lived up to his name. That's known in Montreal for Andres Galarraga, but it's also known in Tampa <laughs> oh, yeah. for the big cat between the pipes as we switch from the diamond to the ice sheet. He made save after save. Tony, you noted that three-save sequence that he made. Some saves spectacular, some routine. But nonetheless, Dano, when you're outshot 16-7 in the second period, he was standing tall time after time to give his team confidence, even though they know they played maybe their C, D game. He was sensational in this one. I turn to Jaff. Our <laughs> experts, they do their homework. Jaff, you have an idea about fatigue and the blue line and Montreal. So as a noted well-rested person. I'm jealous. This intrigues me. <laughs> it's an amazing, it's amazing be, transition. In, <laughs> in, life, in life, be good at something. Yes. Well, Tony, right. Tony sleeps like right. an expert. Yes. Like an expert. You know, hey, my father always said, you have to be the biggest and best at everything. Find your niche. Yes. Find your niche. I'm jealous. How Thank you. Pay, how do you get paid for that? <laughs> I don't how know. How do you get paid for that? I'll work on it. <laughs> These guys have been money using the paid, the, the top four defensemen for Montreal. Wow. I'm more or less throwing it out there than I am saying that this is what's happening. But, Stuart, you think there's a chance just due to the mistakes, the mental mistakes that yeah. we saw last night, are we seeing perhaps a little mental fatigue come in? They're world-class athletes. These guys, during the regular season, average between 22, 44, and 20 minutes of ice time, the big four. But playoff hockey is different hockey. We know that. We yeah. saw the big turnover, neutral zone, but also then the step up by Sherratt instead of staying back. We saw Edmondson here putting the Edmondson putting the puck back to kind of nowhere. And look, they're they're not only are they, you know, taking hits from the opponent, and Tampa's been aggressive, they've been on them, but they're also giving hits. And by the way, giving hits is equally as tiring as taking Every, hits. You know that as much. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I'm just wondering. I'm just throwing it out there. And while I couldn't agree more with, with Tony, with our pond as well, they played a beautiful game. But are these big guys, are we finally seeing some fatigue in their mental approach to the game? I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a fair point. I really do. Um, I, I think I'm agreeing with you, but there's a little nuance in this for me that, that, I, that I think we're kind of both on the same page. Yes, I think there's some mental fatigue that kind of factors into this. It has been a long, hard road, yep. and that takes a toll on you, especially when you're kind of loading up a lot of minutes on your top four, like we're seeing with these Montreal Canadiens. I will say this, though, uh, to kind of, you know, maybe explain that nuance. This team, Montreal, plays a game that is incredibly strong just in, in terms of the puck management in terms of the structure they have been in my estimation through three rounds almost robotic in the way that they 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 approach each and every loose puck and, and dispose of any you know any puck that's maybe uh, you know it's just a, it's advantageous for them to do so 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 what I'm saying is now you're dealing with in my estimation, the toughest test that this team has, has really uh, faced to this point, and it's testing that puck management, that game structure, in a way that hasn't been tested so far. So they're making mistakes out of poor judgment and perhaps mental fatigue plays a part in that, if that makes sense. I think Tampa has been the, the toughest test for this group, and that's why we're seeing some puck management decisions that have been uncharacteristic for that top four especially uh, and going back to last night and and perhaps even into game one yeah I mean listen Tampa's here's a great analysis they're good right and they're yeah. deep and they're strong and they're gonna keep coming after you so I, I get it but again I was just looking at the minutes and I was looking at the, it's the type of minutes going against yeah. you know that Gordon line they're on top of you all the, the, the time. margin of error is thinner now than yes. it has been through the prior three rounds and they faced them some tough opponents mm -hmm. but there isn't a team in They've, the tournament yeah. Uh, or in the league, for that matter, built like this group, the Tampa Bay Lightning, or as experienced and well-seasoned as the Tampa Bay Lightning, it's a, it's a challenge of a whole nother order. 
Well, Johnny, it's not often the Tampa Bay Lightning allow 40-plus shots against, but they do so in game number two against Montreal. But Vazzy was there to save all but one of those 43 shots on net. That's why you love your goalies. When they can just bail yeah. you out, you have a terrible game. You're not on point. The other team's carrying the play. They're getting the chances. Yeah, Vasilevsky, for the first two periods, was unbelievable. The only reason this game was close and that Tampa eventually took that lead late in the second was because he was so on point. Montreal played so much better in this game. They had all kinds of shots. 40 plus, as you mentioned, had a lot of traffic, a lot of lateral plays, everything you want to do as an offense. They had plenty of power plays, except they could not solve Andre Vasilevsky. And you get a sense of how good he's playing right now. The goals against speaks for itself compared to Carey Price, the five on five save percentage, an outrageous number, short handed Carey Price, that great penalty kill. But the number I like to focus on goal saved above average basically means you put an average goalie in and he would have let in 12 more goals Yikes. than Andre Vasilevsky has stopped. And Carey Price has a pretty good number himself with four, but it's a third of Vasilevsky. I was going to say, 12 divided by four I mean, is three, you can so do that, triple. Matt. He's done three times as many, and, <laughs> and, that's, and, and that is the challenge for Montreal. They know this guy is playing that well, and they have to run four out of five against him. That will be tough to do, but uh, he was the reason. Tampa won game two and is up 2 nothing in the series. He certainly was. And despite the loss, a lot of positives to take out of this game for the Montreal Canadiens, including a better effort from some of the younger players. Yeah, and Nick Suzuki didn't have a good first game. He knows that. He'd tell you that. He got matched up against Braden Point, Nikita Kucherov, and Kucherov and Point won that battle. And in game two, he played against those guys quite a bit. Maybe not quite as much, but enough. And he was much better. Played with confidence, was assertive, and certainly brought a shoot-first mentality to the game. He was putting pucks on net all night long and trying to break down coverage with shots and traffic. He was digging in on the face-offs because he knows having possession and not having to chase Kucherov and point around is really important. And so I thought he was the number one center that the Montreal Canadiens count on him being. He's their most important offensive player. And so it's imperative that he plays really well. And throughout the game, start to finish, he was excellent. And he Lucked out, I guess, on this long backhand dribbler that went in. But when you put almost 10 shots on net, maybe you do deserve a break every now and then. I thought that was a great bounce-back effort by Nick Suzuki to, to play as strongly as he did after being challenged and not having the game he wanted in Game 1. Really shows the strength of his game and of his mental um, discipline to, to, to not let it paddle him and come back and be even better. And how much better was he? Well, again, we look at the numbers. Game 1 versus Game 2. His Corsi percentage in game one, under 40, was the worst on the team. No bueno. Game two, he's well over 50%. 56% of scoring chances when he's on the ice. And oh yeah, a tidy nine <laughs> shots on goal and the one goal. That is a stat-stuffing kind of night for Nick Suzuki. And the best part about it is he can take that confidence, come back to Montreal, and now get preferred matchups. He won't be against point all the time, and maybe that opens him up for even more offense. I'll tell you what, I play fantasy hockey during the regular season, and if I see a nine spot in the shots on goal category, it's like I'm automatically buying the dude's jersey Have to. because I'm Have just to. like, I don't know if that I do that in my entire career one time. Huge number. It's a massive night. Massive night for Nick Suzuki. And this goes without saying, for any team, scoring first is always right. important, but it might be the most important thing for the Montreal Canadiens going into game number three because they have not led in this series yet. Not yet. And you think about Montreal when they went that great run through Winnipeg and on into Vegas, and how long they had that lead for they went like seven eight games without ever trailing it was wild and not surprisingly the two teams in the finals are the two teams that have scored first the most in the playoffs and montreal like every team is more comfortable when you score first it makes the other team chase the game a little bit makes them maybe force plays which which you can defend and then counterattack. it really sets up their game plan and i think for game three if they can get one early well one it buys them a little cushion in case tampa scores which they probably will and it also will light this building on oh. fire. And I think they need to feel that kind of energy. It was certainly evident down in Tampa. Montreal would like to feel that from their fans here. But they have to give them reason to cheer. Play with the lead. Get comfortable. Get confident. Make them feel like they're in the series instead of chasing it like they have for the first two games. Three things the Montreal Canadiens will have in game number three that they have not had this entire series. Their own fans in the building. Mm -hmm. Dom Ducharme behind the bench. And last change. We'll see that what they do with those three things tomorrow here at the Bell Center.